Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the 36th edition of the California Small Farm Conference. My name is Guido Lois, and I'm a communications and events manager for CAF, which is Community Alliance with Family Farmers. We're so happy to have you here. We have an amazing panel today. And before I give the mic to Ben, I think he's going to start talking. I wanted to cover a few logistics. Please know, know that this webinar is being recorded and that if you have any questions, you can fill them in the, with the Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen. You can also let us know of any comments that you have with the chat feature. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to thank our sponsors before we start for making this possible. Their support is, has been amazing this time. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say about it. So Ben, please take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and thank you for having us. And thank you everyone for joining us on this beautiful sunny sun, Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm moderating this panel today and I feel blessed to have these panelists with me. I feel like I've assembled a, a team of superheroes here. So um, I won't take up too much time, but I am the Vineyard Program Manager at Napa Green. And that's a nonprofit based in Napa that certifies the sustainability and educates around sustainable wine growing and social justice and climate action in the wine industry. But we won't be talking much about wine today. Um, we're really focused on how to repair broken ecosystems through landscape scale restoration projects and implementation and uh, long long range stewardship. So. My interest in this topic started way back in the 1900s, um, reading the great works of like Gary Snyder and Sarah Carson and Aldo Leopold and, and Wendell Berry. And those are the works that I often come back to because I always feel um, drawn to the talk of bioregionalism and natural history and the ways that agriculture can repair communities and landscapes. And so I studied sustainable agriculture uh, at a small school in Northeastern Vermont called Sterling College. Um, and while I was there, my, one of my first semesters, I took, I had classes in systems thinking, ecology, and sustainable agriculture all at once. And then I realized that it's really like the same ethos. You know, they're all trying to achieve the same goals and there's so many through lines. It's it's really just a way of thinking that I I really that resounded well with me, and so I went on to have a or my senior thesis was titled a whole systems design for regenerative agriculture in northern Vermont, and it outlined like forestry and uh, it was on a floodplain site, and so I was looking at forestry, agroforestry, pastoral ecologies and producing food and so it it's always been a thought of mine to to really leave the the farms that I touch and manage and even own uh, with this long-term plan for for whole systems thinking uh, but when you go to college you you often have to really specify what you want to what, what you want to learn about and then especially as you go up in the in in your degrees into master's or, or PhD, you're really specifying um, what you're doing, sometimes in a reductionist way and very Western thinking way, where you end up being a special specialized thinker in one specific way. And it's like, I, I hear like a soil scientist say like, oh yeah, I don't know much about plants, but you know, I'm, I'm really focused on the soil. And that's just not really how these problems can be solved. And so in my current position, I help growers find funding sources to implement progressive practices in the vineyards and so that could be a soil health thing there or a you know salmonoid uh, habitat restoration thing over there or even a forest fuel reduction on the other side and it ends up being this popcorn kind of map of projects that have been funded across a county but it's not looked at in a holistic way and so uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today is really uh, trying to tell some stories about some projects that have approached landscape stewardship in a holistic fashion, and hopefully come up with some specific ways that you can take home as land stewards to work with your neighbors and exponentially increase 
your impact by working together. And recently I had the opportunity to speak to a group of about 20 young wine growers from Champagne, the Champagne region of France. And they were wondering about the sustainability efforts at Napa Green. And so I was outlining, you know, our uh, water efficiency standards and how we write a custom carbon farm plan for each site. And Napa Green does full property certification. So we're also looking at the forest because a lot of uh, landowners have, have forest land. And we got into that uh, issue in California, which is a hot topic and explaining, you know, the, the broken forest ecology and, you know, the dug firs choking out the oaks and how we really need to maintain our woodlands. And they just didn't get it. They just kept coming up with all these questions. And they were just like, well, why don't you just cut down the trees? Why don't you use the wood? Can't you use the wood? Like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And I realized that I just needed to like really take it back to, you know, change the perspective. Like they come from a region in France that has been managed by Western civilization for thousands of years. And so every inch of that region has been touched by Western hands. And that's just not the case in Northern California. And so I had to explain, you know, over the last 20,000 years, uh, this landscape evolved, co-evolved, the, the plants, the animals, and the people co-evolved to manage this space in perpetuity. And then once colonialism came in, that was all broken. And so that Western civilization came in and all of a sudden we were draining wetlands, we were channelizing streams, we were, um, you know, squelching any forest fires and we were, you know, decimating the herds of lives or <laughs> the herds of um, wildlife that would naturally manage those landscapes. And never mind the intentional and indirect decimation of the indigenous population and that knowledge base, like that is what we're trying to recreate now. And so we're trying to piece back all those pieces back to ma maintain these ecosystems in a way that can be done naturally. And we don't need individualistic farm plans or, you know, uh, very specific location-based solutions. What we need are watershed, county, regional plans that, co that comprehensively address all of the mismanagement and broken systems that Western culture has created in the American West. Just implementing one piece, you know, on one site uh, won't be successful. We need to prioritize our efforts and funding in successful projects that look at long-term goals as well as long-term management to have all of those pieces be successful. And um, stacking functions is really important here. And so whether it's regenerative practices in on a farm or you know multiple habitat improvements on a stream or even the activities that you can do to improve your personal health, like implementing a diverse array of actions really stacks those functions and makes the impacts exponentially more successful. And so let's, you know, get back to the superheroes that I was talking about here. Um, Jeff Creek from the Carbon Cycle Institute is going to start us off with how we all start with a carbon and looking at these holistic landscape enhancements through a carbon lens. Then we're going to hear from Mimi Castile from Hopewell Wine uh, looking at it with a water lens or, you know, in the in the water shed. And then we're going to get into the goat herds and sheep herds with Sarah Kaiser from Oat, Wild Oat Hollow. And she's going to explain how we maintain those projects long term with grazing and good fire. And so after that, we'll discuss some limitations and opportunities that we have with funding and with uh, how these projects can come about. And at the end, we'll have some time for question and answers. So feel free to use the question and answer function within Zoom. We'll be monitoring that. And if you have any specific questions for like specific panelists, feel free to just mention that in your question. But uh, I'll let Jeff take it from here. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so where to start, right? We're talking whole systems. So where where does it start? Um, uh, I think uh, the issue of carbon for me 
emerged out of my own farming experience. Um, and, you know, as a, as a young farmer, um, starting out reading, you know, some of the classics that, that Ben mentioned, um, and then trying to apply that to the landscape. Um, and really throughout, throughout my farming career, which spanned about 35 years in Marin County, focusing on soil organic matter is like the key element that I was most focused on. Um, but of course, in the face of the climate crisis, and the understanding of the relationship between that that soil organic matter question and the climate question uh, became very real and and very graphic as as we've all seen. Um, so, in that context, um, myself and others started the Marine Carbon Project, and the the, the underlying <clears throat> the underlying question there was: Could we could we utilize agriculture to increase soil? organic carbon. Now, I'd been doing that for, at that point, by 20, for 25 years. So I wasn't, uh, it wasn't a wild, wild, crazy idea. But what we hadn't done up to that point was really quantify the potential on our, particularly our Marin grazed grassland systems. So focusing on carbon then, we simply added some carbon to the system to see if we could then come back and measure a change. And that was, that was really critical if we, we we knew if we couldn't measure a change, we were going to be um, unable really to have much of a story to tell. So we put half an inch of compost out on grazed grasslands in year one. And then over the next four years, now Dr. Be Becca Riles conducted her dissertation research on what happened next. And what happened next was that the system responded as a system. Of course, we saw an increase in carbon from the compost application. But more importantly, we saw, and this was really kind of a surprise, we saw enhanced photosynthetic capture of carbon in response to the compost application. So in other words, the pasture system responded by to the compost application by increasing the rate of photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthetic gain of CO2 from the atmosphere. And that was, that was a wake-up call for all of us. Um, you know, ben mentioned systems theory. I'd been dabbling in systems theory. I saw it as a as holding some keys to what I was trying to do. But when I saw the results of the Marine Carbon Project, I it all sort of fell into place. Now, very quickly, our regional producers got very excited about spreading compost all over the place, all over their pastures. And, and I was like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, that was just a hypothesis test, guys. You know, that was just to see if we could do this and measure a change. The reality is there's a lot of different ways to increase carbon capture on working lands. And that's when we began to develop the concept of carbon farm planning, because we, we looked at the classic soil conservation service conservation planning process. And we said, well, what's missing from this? And what's missing is, an, is the understanding of the central role of carbon in all of these dynamics and the whole question of conservation planning. It's simply been absent. And so we developed a carbon farm planning process focused on carbon capture, using carbon as an organizing principle around which an entire farm plan could be built. Because as, as you walk the landscape of the farm and discuss operations with the producer, you see multiple opportunities for addition, additional carbon capture. And those can be woven together into a whole farm plan, which can then, by focusing on carbon, basically opens the door to an understanding of how solar energy is entering the system and moving through the system and supporting farm production, uh, restoration of, of degraded ecosystems, biodiversity on farm, and on and on and on. That then led to the understanding that this work, this work with agriculture and carbon and agriculture as a fundamental, powerful solution to the climate change issue led to the integration of agricult agriculture into first the Marin Climate Action Plan, the Marin County Climate Action Plan, and subsequently into other county climate action plans, looking at regional opportunities for enhanced carbon cut capture on working lands. And so we've sort of gone from a literally a, a, a plot size research project embedded in the landscape to landscape level planning now to really regional planning um, 
around, again, focusing on the opportunity for enhanced carbon capture on the landscape. I could stop there and um, either take questions or, or pass it on to um, the next speaker. You're muted, Ben. Yeah, I don't I don't see any questions at this moment. Um, Mimi, do you wanna take it from here? Sure. Um, so I'll try to be brief because I think this will get more interesting the more we can interact and um, get into questions and things. But um, much like the background of our, um, our esteemed panel here, I have a background in systems ecology and systems biology. And um, my first, I grew up on a farm uh, and grew up in, in winemaking and that's what I do now. But in the middle of my <laughs> journey, um, I was a forest ecologist and I started my forestry journey. I sort of paid my way through college by um, being a wildland firefighter. And that was my first sort of um, opportunity to start asking questions about agriculture as it relates to systems biology and the way that historically our agriculture has been a way of creating gaps in ecological function and connection. And specifically, you know, the hydrology of our water catchment systems. And, you know, having worked in public land management for a very long time, and been a part of a lot of restoration projects and a lot of um, very focused, very, um, very well-intentioned projects. We have historically in, in the ecological sciences and especially on public lands approached restoration from a, a plant, you know, sort of plant first um, approach. And in a lot of cases, those projects have very little durability once they've been, you know, sort of determined to be finished and, you know, the management sort of takes a step back. They don't, they lack the durability because we didn't start with the sort of first principles and the way that landscapes built themselves over time. We can't do photosynthesis without water. And as our ecosystems become less hydrated, um, specifically because of how we do agriculture, we lose ecological function. And it gets very, very exponential just in the way that, you know, because carbon is, is special and sticky, water is also special and sticky in its own ways, but it has these magical powers depending on how it shows up in the environment. And the way that agriculture likes to put water into the environment is by artificially draining seasonally high water tables with, you know, sub subsurface drain tiles. And then additionally, the way that we break ground to, um, you know, with our cultivation practices, we are releasing water into the air with soil at the same time. And so we've very fundamentally changed the way that water is showing up both um, in the soil and in the atmosphere. And water as a greenhouse gas has, you know, a much higher heating potential than either carbon dioxide or methane, but because it's transient and, and it shows up in different ways, it doesn't get considered um, at the, those high reaches when we're talking about it globally, but it really does have a much more powerful effect on local heating and cooling than any of the other greenhouse gases do, especially in the short term. So the idea behind this, you know, this work on watershed repair is that we start with pulling more water into our soil reservoirs as quickly as we possibly can. And that's through better soil management. And like Jeff said, by growing soil instead of trying to lose it, um, like, you know, the way that we, we have approached it before, but then also um, kind of trying to slow water down and start building a reservoir back over time. And we can do that even while we are doing agriculture, but we need to change the way that we think about it because water and the way water has moved into inland areas over time is through the biotic pump of plant magic and you know evapotranspiration. And it should not be lost on anyone to think that every, every gram of water that moves through a plant through the evapotranspiration process in that phase change uses 500 calories of heat 
And so that is a direct and measurable effect that we can have on local cooling through better agriculture and adding photosynthesis, which also adds to carbon reservoirs. And so these things start to layer on top of each other and we can start to build the case for how ecological function can return to high productive, high value agricultural lands. And I'm gonna stop there um, and we can get deeper into that if we want to, or you can poke me if I left out anything really, um, really big, but um, I was just trying to give a, an overview of that, if that suits you, Ben. Sure. Um, can uh, can you give an example of like a project that you've seen that's been successful in in that? And like, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's most it's it's easiest to understand these concepts when you when you have you know hard examples to look at. So, um, in Napa and and Ben is kind of a part of this project that we're working on. Um, we are replicating a paired watershed study that was um, that has been done in multiple places around the world, but a closely mirrored ecosystem in the sort of uh, Mexican border with Arizona. Um, we have a, um, a paired watershed study where they used rock gabion walls, beaver dam analogs, different rock structures. So sort of ecological structural pieces that are being put back into highly incised channels of water that would you know basically drain any water event any massive rain event because we know that right now our rainfall patterns have changed especially in the arid west where we're trending towards less water for longer periods of time and then huge amounts of water that we just can't hold on to so you start with uplands and you put in structures that will help slow it, spread it, hold it in place for as long as possible. And that allows for soil to be grown in place because once there's water back in those much, you know, aridifying environments, plants can start to come back and you start to rebuild the riparian zones that help hold water in the upland areas. And that, you know, allows for vegetation to be green longer. And then it drains more slowly into the mid slope and the lowlands and the valley ecosystem so that that water is draining into those water tables later on in the season after the heavy rainfall has already passed. So you get that percolation effect that we've lost because we have been kind of really trying hard to drain these landscapes faster. Um, so the idea is really to start as high as possible and affect the um, mean residence time of how long we can hold water in the uplands so that, you know, that percolation really starts to return to lower elevation areas. And there's a beautiful NRCS study that we can link to if anybody wants to look. And that's kind of what we're trying to replicate now with the SNAPA project. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, uh, we have some questions, but I think let's just go to Sarah and then we'll get into the discussion towards the end and just let her do her thing. So, Sarah. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for coordinating and pulling this panel together. And thank you, Mimi and Jeff. Um, I hope I can follow up on both their presentations and presentations in a really holistic way. Um, I'm Sarah Kaiser of Wild Oat Hollow, and I help originally came to this work as an environmentalist, but also deeply connected to the land and animals and grew up kind of with the knowledge that humans and animals of human intentions should be off the land for appropriate environmentalism and have grown into through a lot of my work with community grazing cooperatives, through working with indigenous fire ecologists, through working with communities and municipalities and public land managers, that we need all of these systems in place and that humans need to be a part of an, this healthy ecosystem. That by the removal of the indigenous, indigenous land tenders of doing the work in which they basically gardened the West in a beautiful, eloquent way through fire and the use of wild ungulates as grazing animals, tended it to be one of the most productive places in, in this country for our indigenous cultures. So how do we go back to that after a history of removing fire from the land, of fencing private and public properties, of thinking that no impact is what this land needs, 
is coming back to knowing quality, careful, tending impact is exactly what we need. But we also need to be producing food and fiber and have appropriate land stewardship on the land to feed the communities that live here. So by bringing animal agriculture, and I don't think it just has to be animal agriculture, but by bringing grazing ruminants back into a ecosystem in which they are managed by carefully tending shepherds and herders to move across the landscape, across private and public owned lands, where we aren't seeing land tending and land ownership through, I mean, land production through single property lines, through public lands versus private lands. We aren't seeing that land stewardship and agriculture actually against each other. They're actually working towards the greater goal to serve each other and also finding value in the people doing the work and making sure they can live in a live and be paid in a way that they can survive on this land. The people producing our food have to make a living to produce the food for their community. The land needs to be tended and safe from wildfire. We need to have openness across borders and grazing ruminants are a great way to begin that and a great way to cover that landscape across our wooies and are close to um, homes and infrastructure. But I also think, and Pepperwood Preserve is doing a good job of bringing a lot of good fire back to the land. And a lot of that fire, they're handing that over to the indigenous fire ecologist, Clint McKay and his family. They're handing over the ability for them to bring back their practices within their family. So what became kind of a burden of tending that 4,000 acres, and please correct me, I might have that wrong. I think it's 4,000 acres, but tending that is building the trust with a community that can come back and bring their fire and also building the relationship with grazers that are on that landscape as well. So recovery, building trust, believing in each other, again, is a big part of this work. Um, so I guess I need, I want a little broad, I'll try to bring it back down. So really what I what we're trying to do with animals, and I'll, I'll bring together tr two instances that I feel blessed to be in Sonoma County. I've been blessed to work with both our RCDs, our Resource Conservation Districts, Sonoma and Goldridge, which are really thinking big and progressive in their land stewardship models and their funding of land stewardship. So they've started their Land Smart Grazing Project Program, which was funding contract grazers, funding private landowners and communities. And they were really trying to get communities to graze together. And the grazing, hiring contract grazers was specifically for vegetation management because Sonoma County has been really, really, really heavily hit by fires and we continue to. So that happened, they had three, three different outputs of that funding to be able to contribute to that. And what they did was they were bringing communities together. So not one person was managing their landscape, but a whole neighborhood was sharing the responsibility of the animals. They started to see if they grazed year one and year two, they started to see all the scotch broom was gone. That was really unsafe in their understory. They, they're seeing returning of clumping grasses. They're starting to see an ecosystem evolution, not just vegetation management. So if we start to look, how can we fund these things for three, five, 10 years and understand the evolution is to bring the landscape back to a healthy fire ecosystem through grazing and or prescribed burns or different systems like that. Grazing is a great input and it also is gonna build support the agricultural community through contract grazing. Some of the, um, they also opened up some funding to some of the established community grazing cooperatives, which actually have their own herd or flirt. Flirt is both sheep and goats, which are passed around the community. And in doing so, not one person's responsible for the animals year round. So people can go on a trip and not feel burdened. They have resource, shared resources. And as they pass them around the neighborhood, they get to know each other better. They're more committed to each other. When there's fires, they're knocking at each other's door. They're taking care of each other in a way they hadn't before they'd gotten there. They have local food system because everybody gets a lamb in the freezer. And they have really well-managed uh, pastures all around the neighborhood because the sheep are in one place and then getting rest in one place and then that place gets rest. So they're doing active prescribed grazing through the sharing of animals moving around rather than each landowner having their own stock and having a heavily stocked all year round grazing. So through a shared experience, a whole community gets served, everybody gets fed and they are practicing better ecosystem services and seeing an evolution of their landscape. So how do we extend that beyond that? The phase four of the Landsmark grazing 
the funding that the RCDs have achieved is to help with public land grazing or public land management, highlighting grazing as a tool. But we're really doing research now. How do we find ways instead of funding one application? How do we do a three year plan? How do we begin to fund some infrastructure support for communities and public land managers so that they have the impact and a long term agricultural component? So a lot of public lands are right next to ranchers that are doing really good work that may be doing compost application that are doing prescribed grazing on their land. What if they would have access to that regional park that's 500 acres, provide the grazing services for free and the, the park gets service and is doing all of those things at the same time. So with a long-term contract, so our food producer has five years of graze instead of one year. So they know how long they can manage the herds. They know what they can grow. They have long-term impact of the land and our regional parks or public land managers are able to reduce their costs of vegetation management. Communities get served, our agricultural community gets served and our public land managers get served. So we're working on how do we create that across the county for all public land managers? How do we eventually bring that into Napa and Marin and Mendocino and create a regional plan. You know, we we don't have to stop at county lines. Like how do we get us all together, create regional plans that work with an infrastructure using grazing and fire in which the water systems are good. We're increasing carbon sequestration into the soil. We're all having this positive impact while we do community education and provide long-term sustainable land opportunities for agricultural producers in those regions. So city of Petaluma is another one I want to highlight because they started their, their grazing plan and I'm really, their pilot grazing plan and they want to continue it. They have a five-year plan, which, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be working with the RCDs or with somebody um, to get them a carbon farm plan for all their grazing places to really have a strategic plan. So planning for zero to five years, how do we become fiscally sustaining in our grad? How fiscally sustainable in our grazing. There's always going to be some output, but what, how do we do that over five years? And then over the six to 10 year plan is how do we then extend that grazing to all the private lands around us? How does one herd, one flock manage all the public place, the town, get enjoyed by the town, vegetation management is handled. Maybe we see clumping grasses come back. We're increasing the carbon sequestration year round because we've created a system that is the greens back increase carbon sequestration, increase water absorption because we have deeper root system, deeper root systems, um, more opportunities for agricultural producers and our private and public land managers are cross-pollinating and serving each other across the board. So that's the long-term vision. And I do think we need to think bigger, go across all the systems and be, realize it may take 10 years to reach our goals, but if it took 150, 200 years to get where we are, <laughs> We can't correct it in a year or two. One application or one year of funding is not going to create the change, the evolution we're looking for, because we also have to bring across the cultural evolution of the people on the land, seeing it, understanding its value, and being a participant in that transformation. So um, that's, you know, that's why I love that the RCDs are looking at doing longer applications of funding. We're just trying to think, like, how do we move out of this myopic system and we can start at a county level and build from there. We're hopefully going to work, maybe uh, receive, go after, a, go after, <laughs> write, uh, chase down a Cal Fire grant because they're now some releasing a five-year grant. How do we use that for fire fuel load reduction, but also with an ecological evolution over five years? So we may not write the plan for ecological evolution, but that's what we're our ultimate goal with vegetation management as being the funding source. So how do we think big, start to change our funders into realizing single applications and single year funding is not going to get the evolution and support all the systems to have a real sustainability long term. There you go. That was uh, perfect, Sarah. Thank you so much. And that really ties right into what we're going to talk to next. So we might as well, you know, hear from the other panelists about um, some challenges that you see for both funding and implementation of these projects um, on the landscape scale. And um, Jeff, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think Sarah's painted a really beautiful and appropriate vision um, of of where we want to go. Um, I think that there is a clearly a growing awareness. Um, among the 
general population, certainly among the research conservation districts who've made, a, I think, a significant uh, pivot in the last few years in terms of their focus, much broader, much of it brought on perhaps by by increasing fire frequency and all of the risks associated with that. Um, what what I don't think we have is a an understanding among the general population. And so I, while I encouraged by certainly the increased activity, I think we're still lacking general public support. Um, Sarah, Sarah mentioned something about, um, you know, neighboring grazers grazing for free. And, and in some cases that can work. Um, but unless unless the public lands are provided with appropriate infrastructure, um, I think there's a need to provide some financial support to grazers as well. Um, it can be a real challenge to try to manage livestock in the face of public access to lands, for example. Um, and so, you know, I, I think years ago, Alan Savory said the the uh, the ranchers may go, but the but the but the cows will stay. Um, because, you know, he saw the, the need for, for managed grazing ruminants. Um, but we really need a shift, an economic shift, an understanding of, of what economy is and bringing ecosystem services and functional ecologies into our economic analyses. And that, that I think is, is the real challenge in front of us. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. But I think I think I think education, um, the kinds of examples that that um, that that both Mimi and, and Sarah are actually putting out on the landscape, um, some of the work we're doing uh, through carbon farm planning. I think the the more the public is exposed to these ideas and and examples of of, of how this works, in fact, um, and and frankly the. <laughs> The growing climate crisis, I think, is a driver of public interest and understanding of, of what it is we need to do. So I don't think that's an answer, but. Well, I, I'm just going to put you on the spot here. Uh, I, I do think that ecological services in an agricultural system or even wildland stewardship is like definitely where one of the cruxes is in this in this issue. And so where do you think that um, like where does that money come from? Or like, where does that funding come from? Or where do you see that? Like, where's the solution there? And and if you had all the chips, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> well, it turns out I don't have all the chips, but, um, <laughs> you know, we've seen huge, huge steps forward. You know, California Department of Food and Ag over the last few years has really made significant investments. And that, of course, has come through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So there's a, you know, that's a that's a potential, an ongoing source. It could be much bigger, but at least we've got some some movement there. The climate smart uh, commodities work that USDA is has put on the table, you know, th over three billion dollars nationally coming towards this sort of work, um, and that that's significant and it's moving the needle. Um, but we all know that you know that that amount of money, uh, you we're we're prepared at the drop of a hat to spend $13 billion on warfare, um, but we're not willing to invest in in the health of our our people and our and our working lands um, at, at anything commensurate to that level. So we have major social priorities that need to shift, obviously. Um, and that's I think the, the lesson here. And then what we're all dealing with is is a legacy of of colonialism that has been highly destructive. And has really formed the basis of our economy since, well, probably the last 500 years. So it's no small thing to, to begin to transform that. Um, but I think the real work on the ground that people can see and begin to understand, and as I say, the sort of the, the pressure of climate change is, I think, pushing everything in that direction. So. Great. Um... We're going to end with opportunities because that's always the good thing. But Mimi, do you have anything to add to challenges for um, kind of the implementation and planning around around this work? I mean, I think, you know, we, we can't possibly um, scrape the surface even. But I, I mean, everything that Sarah and Jeff have spoken about so eloquently, I mean, for me, 
that it's never a matter of whether or not something is possible. It always comes down to the people and the way that we we think in borders. Our farm bill is completely at odds with, with any of the sort of climate investments that are being made on the other side and trying, it's like we're working against ourselves still, but the fact that we are, that we've got an opposing force now. And while we can't probably imagine immediately a new national farm bill, we can start to see the beginnings of what California, as an example, has been able to do as a state to really start to put it, you know, lead with values around the substrate and not the derivatives of the substrate and really trying to turn that needle a little or turn that wheel a little bit at a time. And I also just want to highlight and put strength to, you know, one of the foundational things that Sarah's work has really um, focused on first, because I, I do, you know, I, I never want it to be this, but it, it really is about people. And the fact that we have lost, we've lost community and it's what people need first before they can find their way back to, you know, sort of ecological function and what it would mean to have redundant layers of, you know, trophic structure and all of the things that we need to have come back. If people felt like they could reach out and depend on their neighbors again, things would happen faster. And so, you know, doing that hard work, because it's the work that is always the hardest of kind of finding community again, you know, with, with our, with our neighbors where we can do work physically together and not try to do something in a place where we really have no control or no idea of what, you know, what the work is actually doing. I think that's huge. I really do. Great. And uh, before we, we have some great questions in the chat. Um, do you, any of you want to share any opportunities that we have? I think that the RCDs have been mentioned and, you know, creating community. I feel like we've kind of talked about both opportunities and challenges here, but is there anything else you guys want to cover before we move on? Um, oh, go, go, you go, Sarah. I just, <laughs> I, I just want to say um, I, I would, I, yes, I encourage everyone, if you haven't, if you're a producer of any sort, please reach out to your RCDs. RCDs are very much engaged there to help you. The NRCS, um, please reach out to them. Both have different services. They work together. They can support our producers. They can, should, they can and will support our public land entities as well. We just have to get those connections. Yeah, and like Mimi said, reach out to your neighbor. Oftentimes, all we need to do look across the fence, see that maybe what they have over there is exactly the resource you're looking for and it's a burden to them. Go knock on someone's door, begin to build that, bridge land access problems by getting to know the people around you, break down vegetation management barriers by getting to know the people around you. And yeah, also like if we can encourage again, like our resource conservation departments, county I feel is the most flexible, our municipalities to begin to see the value of this whole system approach. Um, and be willing to think big and be creative and reach out because like Jeff said, the time is ripe. People know we, our municipalities, our public land managers, our private landowners know that things should be done better, but they don't know how. It is totally reasonable to begin reaching out and be that person that brings the visionary, brings the vision and then allow the rest to come out of it. But don't be afraid of thinking big and bringing your vision to the table. Yeah, and I would just triple down on the RCD question. You know, the the Soil Conservation Service and the RCDs were created out of the Dust Bowl. And we're facing a similar but much greater crisis now. Those, But those entities are there. And they've been signed, kind of moribund for a long time, but they're beginning to reemerge as a, a significant player in this whole equation. And so support them, reach out to them, and utilize them. To the extent that you can, because they're they're great resource, and they need to be more resourced as well. And getting more public involvement with those agencies will help ensure that they are in fact adequately funded going forward. So, you good, Mimi? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we're we're gonna get into questions. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go through them. Some of them are. Uh, organized and some of them are not. 
Um, the first one was for, for Jeff. Uh, why is standing carbon of the cash crop itself in relation to the, the vineyard not considered in the development of a carbon farm plan? Um, Good question. Um, we, we tend to think about the carbon farm uh, plan as all the new opportunities on the farm. So if you're already growing grapes, you're growing grapes. And so for, for really kind of carbon accounting purposes, it's much easier to assume we're starting at zero and that everything we do is additional to that. Um, in many cases, um, you know, land and in some cases, oak woodlands have been cleared to plant vineyards. And so, you know, we, we just kind of want to avoid that whole mess and not go there and just start at, at an assumed zero place. And everything we do is additional on top of that. I hope that answers that. Yeah, and um, and so the for those who don't know, through the carbon farm planning process, you utilize the Comet tool, but doesn't the the California version of that tool kind of account for that carbon sequestration when you're baselining the? the well, carbon? there there are some um, vineyard specific, for example, um, uh, values um, that that do show up in in the. California version, but I, you're still you're still left with the same challenge of you don't really have um, uh, you don't have a, a good picture of the past. You you can you can keep track of what you're doing from this point forward, but you really don't know what the net effect of the past management has been. And Comet Farm, which is a little more complicated tool to use, attempts to do that, but in my experience, there are so many assumptions around past land management practices that the output of Comet Farm becomes, uh, I, I find a little sketch because we simply don't have, in most cases, the depth of farm history to really be able to, to come up with accurate numbers. So again, I'm personally much more comfortable just saying, okay, here we are, we're starting at scratch and we're going to go forward. Um, Definitely. Yeah. How can we increase? Yeah. Exactly. Forward. How can we increase? Great. Uh, we have one from Allison asking about the um, how to fund small scale projects like boots on the ground, you know, implementation. Um, and if there's any case studies or like uh, success stories that you have for small farms trying to implement these projects on a small, small scale. The car, like the carbon farming specifically, or any of the topics, like any, like you know, the watershed things, or any of the things that anyone has talked about today. I'll throw in that RCDs are a great way for small producers to get funding and very flexible, very easy to manage funding. You're not writing some massive grant; they actually do a lot of that legwork for you. So that's a yeah. good place to start. I, I would point you in the same direction. I mean, where I am, we call them SWCDs, but they um, the role of those organizations is to help farmers do better conservation. And so if you come to them wanting to, I mean, even as generally as just say, I want to improve how I'm stewarding my land, they will bend over backwards to help you find the resources. And I have yet to find one, um, even in very rural underfunded places where they didn't have some very enthusiastic person who really wanted to help you figure it out. So that's where I would start as well. I agree. And NRCS as well, you know, they have nationally funded um, programs to, you know, whether it be for the stream or for wildlands or, you know, any improvements they want to do in your land. So great. Um, Mimi, on hmm. the spot. Um, what are the hurdles faced to build a reservoir collection on the farm and what are the ecological implications there? Hmm. Really depends. Um, if you are in a groundwater limited area, there are going to be all kinds of permitting issues around building a reservoir and what your intended use for that reservoir is and what it's going to impact further down in the watershed. Permitting is really um it's just going to be part of how we deal with um, kind of altering the hydrology of any landscape. And I think, you know, we often think of reservoirs as being um, sort of for us, for the protection of our things and, um, and whether that's for irrigation or even for fire mitigation, again, is a very sort of people focused resource, but there is an ecological benefit and where those 
where those reservoirs or wetlands have been drained, um, there's always a, a way to approach it with a, a regulatory agency to talk about the restoration of that. But if you're trying to create one, um, you do need to think about the regulation process and the idea that there's going to be permits involved in, and may not be suitable anyway. But if you just want to have more water on your land, it doesn't have to be a reservoir, right? I mean, the more the more soil we have, the more water we hold over time. And, you know, whether it's, you know, working with um, key lining or just growing more soil or not planting or developing a highly erodible south facing rocky hillside, these are all, you know, parts of how we should be thinking about better land stewardship. And I hope I'm answering this person's question because um, I'm not exactly sure what the motivation was, but I think if we want to build a pond um, in the arid west, uh, there's going to be a regulatory burden there. If you just want to have more water where you are, um, there are multiple ways of doing that depending on how water moves through your place in the first place. So if you're, if you have, you know, perennial streams or even dry stream beds, I would start with putting, putting some beaver dog, beaver log analogs in, I mean, really like trying to just slow water down when it comes really quickly. And it's incredible to see, I mean, I work in places like Montana where it's less than 10 inches of rain and you know, you think there's never going to be water in an incised dry creek again. And for a couple of years, you just put structures in place and as many as you can when people aren't busy. And a couple years later, there's water there for part of the year and there's vegetation coming that wasn't there before. So um, it kind of, you know, depends on my answer to everything, but um, it's, you know, it's always possible. Thank you. Um, well, the, um, can anyone speak to efforts to use native species within agricultural systems, either as crops or cover crops for erosion control? I, I think, I don't know, I'll let you guys take it. <laughs> well, it's certainly a role for native species, um, cover crops, you know, tend to um, tend to be annuals because typically they're used in between uh, cash crop. And so if you're going to destroy that crop, you may not want to invest in the cost of native seed um, for something that's going to be temporary. Um, for permanent cover, of course, great, you know, investigate species that are appropriate for your site and and uh, investigate, you know, the best way to propagate those and and use them by all means, because then not only do you support your soils, but you also support the local ecology that you're that you're part of. So, um, so it's a you know, it really depends on on what your purpose is uh, with those crops. But a cover crop in the in the truly agronomic sense is temporary, and you know, I would say don't waste your money on something that you're going to discunder or, or graze off or whatever. Um, but yeah, native species, wherever possible, absolutely. Certainly in permanent plantings, hedgerows, shelter belts. Yeah, go native where you can, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just yeah. going to jump in on that. Um, so in, in any perennial cropping system, especially in Northern California, like, um, like vineyards or almonds or pistachios or olives, you know, that alleyway can definitely be a, a place for native grass species and they're developed to go dormant during the summer and so whereas most cover crop species are european based and they are very water thirsty and they're gonna die you know when they don't have water uh the native species just go dormant during that time and so if you can actually get locally adapted native grass species to thrive in your alleys then you're very well set up for a permanent cover cropping system and like Jeff said, that, that can be like a big investment because the seed is so expensive. But if it is a long-term plan that you're not going to disc, you're not going to till in moving forward, it's a really great way to increase your carbon capture and have something that's going to come back every year because it's locally adapted. 
I'll also say that there is a massive entrepreneurial opportunity in growing both native uh, perennial shrubs and trees for nursery, you know, like as a nursery, because we are sorely lacking in available resources of native plants, but also the seed. I mean, there are so many people who want to work with native seed and it is so expensive. And the more people, you know, start growing that for seed, we'll get better at doing it with lower inputs and, you know, just healthier plants and locally adapted things. But you know, we just need more of it. Um, so if that was a question wondering whether or not there's an opportunity there, the answer is yes, everywhere. <laughs> and in Northern California, uh, Hedgerow Farms is a great location to to get some of the those land-based species. So um, for Sarah, how do we get ecological restoration community off of the herbicide program? Great question. I'm working on it. I'm <laughs> pounding against some heads on this one. Um, it's definitely for all people trained in the industry of ecological restoration, wildlife biology, native plant regeneration, they are all trained to use synthetic herbicides as one of their primary tools. They are actually heavily trained to not utilize grazing, that grazing and and I can see the argument, bad grazing can be really destructive to our landscapes. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons we lost a lot of our clumping grasses was one, we, the implementation of all these invasive non-natives that are, you know, like oats and grain seeds. Second was because of heavy overgrazing without rest, we lost our clumping grasses. So grazing can be detrimental, but I've always been talking to people, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. It was done poorly. It wasn't the animal. It was poor management. And because we did something bad doesn't mean you throw it away. It means we make realize it was done poorly and we can do it really in a way to regenerate. So using animals in the right way. And that's why I'm constantly having the, the, the it's keeping the conversation. It's learning to build trust with that group. It's continuing to document improvements. So I'm working with a couple of um, uh, native plant organizations and biologists that have a that really are against grazing and think synthetic chemicals are a very viable good tool and one of the ways of regenerating landscapes is to use synthetic herbicides and just kind of kill everything and then they'll plant the natives back so let's kill it let's moonscape it and plant it back where what i'm trying to help them with and I'm identifying places where it's happening and we're trying to do photo documentation and we're documenting the clumping grass is coming back. We're two to three years of appropriate targeted grazing, especially in our understory zones in Sonoma County, um, under oak woodlands or even some of the heavier areas, steeper areas where we're just completely overgrown with scotch broom, which is one of the plants people really use synthetic chemicals on. It's a, it's a really invasive non-native is two years of goat grazing. These hillsides have almost no scotch broom. We've seen two, we've identified two clumping grasses that have never been there for the people that have lived there 50 years have never seen them before. So we're, we're documenting it because if we can prove it and demonstrate that this is a tool that's building topsoil, it's at bringing the seed bank back because our native seeds can live in the soil for 200 years. We, all we need to do is provide the opportunity for them to come up. That's, that's really what we need to do. We don't have to be so hardcore about the way we tend the landscapes. So I think the best way is to keep the conversations open. Oh, know that they're coming from a very emotional place because they think this is how they're going to heal the land. It's not, I don't judge them. I know it's emotional and that we're both trying to do the same thing. So we build trust and we document and we show a different way forward that's working. That's that's kind of the way I'm working on it right now or trying to. <laughs> That's great, Sarah. Yeah, I, I saw a similar thing with perennial grazing at a Cash Creek Conservancy in Yolo County, and the um, it was paired with prescribed grazing and good fire, and it was managed by by native humans, and they saw wildflowers come back to the landscape that hadn't been there in fifty years, and they were like, "I didn't even know these seeds could last that long." But it's it's amazing to see the the landscape regenerate itself. Yeah, went once. Uh, stewarded correctly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, vineyard 
or uh, commodity crops have been successful in passing um, pest management districts, you know, like especially Napa with like glassy wing shark shooter, anything like that. And biological controls through mating disruption with like a, a vine mealy bug and all that. Is there something similar for the grazing community where state funds could be available for the larger plans than a single ranch? And I'll just say on, on the Napa end, this is definitely a conversation because grazing and vineyards has become so ubiquitous in the last like two years, whereas five years ago, it was just unheard of or like, you know, just like the extreme people were doing it. Um, but it really needs to be community based because trucking sheep all over the county just doesn't make sense. So uh, yeah, if anybody has any insight on like how to do that in a community plan, please. I mean, I, I will, I'll just say, I think again, it starts with the people. Um, if you talk to your neighbors, I mean, Sarah's done this work and it's worked here too, where it doesn't make sense for one small farmer to have their own herd and try to figure out where those animals are going to go or how they're going to be used when they're done doing the job that they need to do where they are. So, um, you know, it takes time, but it's worth doing to reach out to neighbors who and just find gauging interest of who might also want to you know, graze their land periodically and finding, you know, um, forested areas that need fire mitigation and then, you know, kind of getting to know who's in the community. I mean, I happened to, there was a, a gentleman who was working with um, one of the vineyard management companies and he had come from a grazing background and really wanted to have animals again, but had no land. And so you, it took two years but now he has a thriving business and connected properties and he wants to expand into another appellation. So, I mean, it, it just takes time and it takes, you've got to want to, you got to want to do it. And I think if you get a couple neighbors together and everybody's kind of it, interested in it, then that will go somewhere if you want it to. Um, but it, it does take time because it, it, it really doesn't make sense. If you try to just figure it all out yourself, um, it just becomes something too cumbersome for somebody who's also trying to grow a crop. <laughs> yeah. To, to add to that, I agree with everything you said, Mimi, and with all of the evolution of these things is think big, start small, start in a way that you can manage, invite, engage neighbors or community around you and let it start small because what happens is people begin to just see and experience the evolution and then more and more people join in. So if there is a little bit like, I'm not sure about this, when they see it's going well, you can add on to it, you can grow. And the same with organizations around you, like the RCDs, when they saw that this work was being done, that's when they realized they'd like to encourage communities to grace together. So think big, have a big dream, bring it forward, but start small in a way that's sustainable. And like Mimi said, be patient. We need to understand that we're asking, and like Jeff said too, we're asking for a cultural shift. Like we have to change our valuation of our culture as long, as well as building out a system that's new and unique. So understanding, start small, be patient, you know, do a lot of hold hand, hand holding <laughs> and bring people together. It's, it's going to take a lot of that community connection and people gaining trust and being patient. That's going to allow the evolution of whatever you're, you're hoping to accomplish or your plan. I know there's an effort right now amongst the, the uh, members of the North Coast Soil Hub to engage in some training around grazing and, and the development of carbon, I'm sorry, of grazing plans, um, because that expertise is lacking amongst um, many of the RCDs. And so I think there's a real opportunity there to to expand awareness of, okay, so what does it mean to, to graze well? Um, how do we do that? Uh, how do we write a plan for that? So that's that's in the works, and, and I, I think it'll have some positive uh, implications. That's that's great, and I do agree. We need to have more boots on the ground understanding of what is good grazing. Like, what does it look like? What does the land look like after you graze? What are the goals of the graze? You know, the grazer is the steward utilizing their livestock to produce a gold on that, that goal on that ecosystem. So it's not a production model. It's a tending and stewardship model. So understanding that it's a service 
and it's a goal oriented. And then what the land looks like when the animals get off is going to be very different than what it looks like four months later and educating people on why different impacts use. Like if you're trying to get rid of Scotch broom, it's going to look pretty beat up, but it recovers really well. And that understanding and uh, the North Coast so Soil Hub is a great place to do that. Also, Paige Lynn Trotter and I are, we applied for a Western Sarah grant. Hopefully we'll get it to do a professional development training for both our professionals, which producers are professionals too. But they use that word for like RCDs, NRCS, you know, any of those. And we'll do producer led for healthy, safe, sane stockmanship workshops. So that as we increase our public land grazing, people are grazing well, the animals are tended well, people know how to move the animals in a sane, safe way. So our public gets our public gets to experience quality grazing. And they're not going out and seeing things that's going to make them think this isn't a good way forward. So we need to, and we need to bring in our producers and our professionals to both be guided and have ongoing training and education on all those pieces. Definitely. Yeah. Um, we're, and we've seen that, you know, with in, in the vineyard system, you know, some grazers see it in different ways. You know, some are looking for ecological outcomes and some are just, you know, basically looking for somewhere for sheep to go. Uh, but I know we're having a workshop that Sarah's actually speaking out on Tuesday and someone from CAF is actually coming to that is working on a toolkit for people trying to uh, develop these grazing plans and have the, the cor correct outcomes for themselves within that. So thank you for all your input on that. Um, and and kind of on that, do you guys think that... Um, carbon farm plans and these plans for carbon sequestration and water absorption need to have managed ungulates on the on the landscape like uh, cows sheep goats or do you think that it can be done by wild animals um and do you think that there's a population of our wild animals to to manage that uh jeff may have something to say that but i would say something too that um the true targeted grazing is going to need to be done through through uh, domestic ruminants because we can't expect to tie in a bunch of wild deer and have the impact we're looking for. Because remember, we're not just looking for a normal impact. We're looking for a transitory, a transition impact. So we often have to have bigger impact than we could ask of wildlife and it would be unhealthy and un unacceptable to them. But I will tell you, the goal of that isn't that the animals stay there on most, especially public land grazing and a lot of large ranchers, they're able to really move their animals around, creating new growth and e ecosystem health in which the ungulates actually provide better food source. They're reducing the tick load because we're reducing brush because a lot of our wildlife are really, really heavily invested, I'm sorry, infested with ticks because we have so much understory and we're not open the way we used to be when it was tended by the indigenous people. And they did use fires as an insecticide. That's how they really kept tick populations down. You know, there was a, so we want to steward it back. And after the grazers come through or after good fire comes through, the deer are right behind them because they love that new growth. It's providing food for the native ungulates and, and the predators and everybody that moves forward through there. So you have less insect problems on them, better growth, and more open, healthy ecosystems for the overall health of the wildlife. So they can't perform that targeted grazing, but we are utilizing it and getting those animals out to provide an ecosystem for the wildlife to be most advantageous for them. Ongoing. Nice. Yeah, I think, you know, it really comes down to a site-specific issue. Um, you know, a small farm may or may not have um, the capacity to include grazing ruminants. I mean, it, it's, it really comes down to what kind of a farm, <laughs> you, you know, if you're a, a one and a half acre vegetable garden, you're probably not going to bring, you might, you might bring goats in occasionally, clean things up, but you know, it really, it really, it's a site specific question, but no question that, that there is a critical and, and wonderful place for grazing animals in landscape management. That's, that's a, that's a given, but whether it's appropriate for a given farm operation is really a site-specific question. Yeah. Great. Uh, um, we got a couple minutes left. All right. Um, 
do well this is kind of a big one so it's kind of saving it towards the end but can anyone speak to the difficulties of getting governmental entities on board um like how can we get county local state entities on board with um some of these larger projects well i'll tell you the carbon cycle institute in our early years um spent a lot of time in sacramento and um, educating <laughs> uh, folks. Uh, I had to once explain photosynthesis to somebody on the Air Resources Board. Um, so lots of <laughs> lots of different ways to engage this question at the governmental level. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> and I'll just say, I mean, I I have also <laughs> given a lot of testimony um, to people who had maybe the first 30 seconds worth of attention and everything else was just way too much. And where I've where I've come to land is that if we can locally organize the people that we can talk to who are invested in this process, our local agency people, and work at a regional scale on outcomes that cannot be ignored, that bring benefit at every level of everybody's lives, not just the wealthiest, I mean, truly everybody, it cannot be ignored at the national level at that point. And so for me, that's just where, you know, I find solace <laughs> is just, if you can do something that's gonna make a difference where you are today, at some point, it can't be ignored anymore. It's not a one-off, it's a, it's a real, it's a real thing. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to follow both of those because they're true. I, I I think that, yes, we need, I mean, and where I started was really at a community, which led to that community and that community, which led to a city, which led to a, led to a county, like to keep going because starting small is important, but we also need Jeff and CCI in Sacramento knocking on those doors. So I think we need to have people coming from below that are the producers, boots on the ground, that are knocking on the doors of their neighbors and building out their system and we need organizations like CCI and other that are willing to go into larger, broader policy. CalCAN is another one. CAP is dipping its foot into policy. We need these organizations that have the ability to get into Sacramento and do that and all and encourage the producers to do the boots on the ground, building from community up. It can't be one. And again, it has to be holistic and all systems happening at once in which we make big changes. Great. Um... I don't want to really get into another <laughs> big question right now. We've got one minute left. So um, there are a couple questions in the chat that I think that we can answer via our email follow-up. Like, how do you create a beaver dam analog? Or yeah. what is this calf livestock you know, um, grazing thing going on? And so we're going to follow up with our contacts as well as um, a couple of resources. Um, Mimi, if you could share some of those or, you know, Sarah and Jeff, please do. And we will follow up with every all of our attendees today um, to you know, wrap that up. So, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, panelists, like my superheroes. Um, this is <laughs> a great conversation. Um, I, I, I feel blessed to have y'all. So thank you for bringing the topic into a panel, Ben. That was really yeah. genius. Yeah, thank you. Really a pleasure. Thanks, you guys. Likewise. That was great. Thank you all. Really appreciate you.